ideas for this as we go along. And so the intention of the next session is for us to hear from, um, should I just say boys? Who have been through our school system at different times and have drawn from it certain uh, things as they've gone along, I would hope, or, or perhaps they've drawn nothing at all, that would also be interesting. Uh, and that um, uh, they are able, we're able to somehow suck that out of there. Uh, it will be useful information for us to use. So what we have at the moment is a recording. We're recording what we're talking about here. And uh, we're going to refer back to that to get a sense of exactly uh, what it is that is said here. And then try and work out, and we have to work out how useful it will be to us uh, when we look at it. So once again, I'm going to hand over to people. I think before I do so, I just need to introduce the panelists here. Um, I'm afraid I'm not that quick on the so I'll ask them each to introduce <laughs> and mention which year they were here. Hi, my name is Sean Todd and I was year 9. Travis Taylor, <laughs> 12 months ago. Kennedy, 
that's quite strange to ask you to do a survey around the school and what principal said, the pupils thought it should happen. The two words that I came to mind was, I think it was honesty and trustworthy. And I think if you, you always have your integrity and the need of situation with your integrity intact, and people can see that you have been honest and trustworthy in that regard, then I think you're on the right track. <coughs> Well, I'd like to pick that together and link it to a certain kind of things we've been talking about recently. Um, it has seemed to be an honest and trustworthy part. Very. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the part that thinks you are. Yeah, but you see, if you, if you were to ask boys really what they think of man, Thirty, fourteen-year-old boys, what they think of maths or the trick boy uh, you will get totally different answers mm -hmm. what you get here now. Because society is giving our children, our boys, the wrong view of what a man is. They and boys think that a man is someone who has got a beautiful chick on his shoulder, on his arm, uh, who can swallow the vast number of years. And it's interesting that, and this is a true story. One boy said to me once that uh, look, he might be beaten by his sister in this and that and everything else, but he can drink more beers faster than she can. And if he takes pride in that, yo, you've got a few problems. So boys think that manhood and our, our role models in society are giving them the wrong view of manhood. That they think manhood is about our car, it's about women, and it's, a, uh, it's about all material things of life, the car that you know. And it hasn't been mentioned once here, which is actually quite interesting. But I bet you, you well, no. That the average boy has a totally different view of man. I'd just like to add just one other thing, which is uh, something I, I feel strongly about, that I think that, in my, in my opinion, the man is someone who actually cons uh, considers, uh, who can walk in the shoes of someone else. If you can walk in someone else's shoes, your son is growing up. He's able to say, thanks for the supper, Mom. He's actually not realized that supper doesn't just appear, that someone actually puts himself up. And if you've got just, our son's doing that, then we're doing our job. So now the questions get harder, so you can have the first one. It's in your mind. To what extent did Don Bogosh manage to inculcate uh, a view of man who's in the You did say there were going to be two questions, I think. Can I give a bit of context? You can. Well, if you like. As you were talking earlier, I'm the guy that grew up in single home, joined the boarding house in standard seven. I left Ron about without any clear idea of what I wanted to be and probably left any relatives without it. So this definition of when you become a man is a relative thing. And I don't think you only realize you're a man and you've probably been a man for a long time and you realize you're a man. But, and I think if I look back finally on, on this school, this school, this school gives you a context. You know, not necessarily just the context. It gives you a way of thinking, a way of behaving, it gives you a character, it gives you a product that I think is so what I needed, I mean you were maybe a sister sense of belonging, I needed a place to belong. I needed to find a, a community that I could feel that I was unique in. So that on the one hand I was an individual, on the other hand I was part of a collective. And I think that's what this school did exceptionally well for me. I've been out for 10 years and I've been out for So that was very, very important to me because it gave me a way of thinking which helped me make my own decisions so that when life throws up a bit of stuff, um, and so I can't remember the context that I was in, but I can remember the context in which I was in. And that was exceptionally important to me. That's the stuff that I was in. And now I'm part of the three groups. I don't have to pass that on son, but I'm part of the girls. Um, and that's what I'm going to do. Okay, now I'll go to Chris next. Chris, to, uh, to what extent did you not watch King Paul Kate values of man with him? I think you've just been slapped on the wrist.
And I think for me, because of the kind of person I was, um, the, the intellectual attitude that I got from certain of the teachers that I had at that time was something which stayed with me forever. I was also I was totally used to sporting, but I was given every opportunity to play and enjoy no matter how bad I was. <coughs> And those are two things that have, that have been with me ever since. I was intellectually challenged, not by all the teachers, they weren't all wonderful, but there were enough of them that that was enough to set me up for whatever, whatever I was going to do with my life. So not too much on the emotional side, I was a bit of a, well, the word nerd wasn't invented yet, but I was the guy who did well academically and otherwise didn't really notice it and surprised us hard not to be nerd. Why did you produce such a big sentence? I want to bring your topic So that's what I'm going to do. Yeah, just touch on something very interesting there that uh, you have to bear in mind as teachers of boys' school, at boys' at boys' school, and that is boys work for the teacher, girls work because it's the right thing to do. They work for mom. They work, yeah. But uh, but boys work for the teacher. So that is just like the teacher. And that's something that's, that's teachers have to bear in mind. So you have to get, get the boys on your side. Front. <coughs> uh, my father, um, I come from a family that's uh, abused. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Father. <laughs> 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 um, my parents were divorced when I was in grade nine and seven. Um, I've probably been quite unhappy and I was a long time before that. Um, during that time, I was fortunate enough to have teachers that, from junior school areas, that were, were long models, really they were. Um, sorry. But not necessarily all in the same way that they were, were fantastic people, but they were genuine people. They might not have been the best academic teacher, but they were there. Um, I think of people like uh, Mr. Martin at the prep school, and I think of some of the groups like Sax, and uh, Strange man, I've got a crab but without the cons teacher. <laughs> but when people say I don't care, but as Chris says, he got a smile, he was he was very centric, I suppose. But he got through to me and he was there for the time that I needed him. I remember Simon Ferguson <coughs> calling me out to his cottage in the Highlands at the moment. The folks had just got divorced. It was a Sunday afternoon, he said, Come, cycles in the house. And we sat down and we had a coat. And that made an impact that I remember to this man. Uh, so yes, the academics, there were teachers that got me good marks, and I got involved with that just because they were good teachers. But I think being a good teacher, um, yeah, there were there guys who really made an impact on me, and that, those are the reasons of why I went into teaching because of the impact that I made on my life. That's yeah, quite powerful what he's saying there, because uh, it's going to be quite your book tomorrow as well. Um, is that we're trying to make our boys more caring. So now you've got a, an old model who's been caring and in time you will pass that on. Right, Sean? What values did Ron Washington place into you to make you a better man? I think, um, I think the imprint is quite subtle and it's part of the process which doesn't necessarily, or which doesn't end once you meet Ron Bosch. Um, and for me what was most valuable is that I was in the boarding house as well, um, and, and I was at school. So um, I found that I had a, I had a safe space um, in, both, in both places where I could express my intellectual and emotional characteristics safely and have them conditioned in the right way by teachers. Um, and I think, and not only teachers, but by peers as well. And that has to do with the quality of teachers, I think, and the quality of, of peers is always in the grade. <coughs> And that, yeah, so, so it's really just for me, it's about a value set, which was, um, which was provided to us as an example. Well, what's going through to me in all this is a huge responsibility we have as teachers. Every single one has an intro teachers. Oh. <laughs> that um, well, yeah, well, I wouldn't bought it, for sure. Oh, this is a day where it's come back to day where it's shown. But the um, first university now, and the, the change that I've noticed between the type of people and the way people act, from Ron Bosch to just the knowledge is huge. And it's something 
I'm going to come accept it, you want to watch that. You just meet new people and you come and you know, the door open to teach you the other way that sort of thing. And you notice the change once you leave that little environment. So it's a subtle thing that kind of moves along from grade eight. It's just, it's not really something you can put your finger on rather than it's just each teacher expects that from his or her class at the beginning of the day. Each teacher expects that sort of thing from, from that individual and from you as well as that. So it's, it's not something that is a single thing that you can kind of switch on board to. It's a process that's come through and I think it's made a huge difference. You don't notice and once you're in that environment that's kind of feeding that little <coughs> interaction, it just it's exponential how it sort of has has a amount of day pitched into you without, without really noticing until you put into a situation where you need to do that. Okay, so teachers setting their expectations, I think you say that's part of bring out for us. And just expect more from them to like behavior, academic work, whatever else, set those expectations. And as teachers of boys, as parents of boys, you know that you can't just tell them once. Got to do, I just say to our staff at school, you've got to tell a boy something 17, 20 times before you even begins to, begin, before it begins to penetrate. You never tire of going over and over saying, you're fair. Don't you do this to me, Papa? Don't love you personally. <laughs> Julian? It was, it was interesting that as when I came to grade 8, I think what I really valued there was a chance to, as has been mentioned earlier, a chance to belong. It's quite nice to be able to find an identity. Mine back then, I think, was largely based around drama, music, and academics. It was nice to find a space there. I've got friends that I made in grade eight that we still see each other quite regularly. What I did value, though, was the opportunity later on in the senior grades that they didn't have to be all, that there were opportunities to explore other aspects. And so it's quite nice um, that I could have that as my base, but I could still also be able to play 13 water polo that I could still you know, do a bit of this and a bit of that. And it was quite useful as a, as a way of being able to set the pattern for future growth in my life. That I didn't have to be one thing, but there were opportunities that if I took them, they were there. Going into teaching now myself, my last two years of conversations with anybody that was in my year at school has involved usually at least three or four, possibly more people who are in this room at the moment as I sit and reflect and say, what was it about this that was so special? And there are many of you who are here that are very excited for me to see some of your faces. But I think of the different things that you do. So if I could possibly name some names. Um, my, uh, my maths teacher was Susan Carletti, who I'm really looking forward to having a chat with later. And something I got from her was absolute like, academic freedom just to be curious. So, in the end, I think in, in the trip, uh, I assume that the papers have been updated, but she gave me a whole pack of exam papers. And it was about 15 uh, AP or advanced papers and said, here you go, do this. And just the expectation was there to go up. About a month later, I, I handed her back another stack of papers and said, here's your memo. So, <laughs> a little bit to sort of copy back then. But it was really great that there was an expectation from teachers that I should be really good at something if I was interested in it. But I should explore it. It wasn't enough just to pass, but that I was doing it for me, not, not for a system. But this is for me that I was doing this stuff. Uh, and that's, I think, something that's been invaluable as I have lived my life and also as I now am teaching and trying to think how can I do what those kind of teachers did for the boys that are now teaching? So, thank you, boys. Thank you, boys. There are a few things that have come up. What I'll be in any manual on boys. And the one that came strongly in my first period to speak this was what was relationships and the building of relationships. Without that you can't uh, you won't be boys on your side. The second one is expectations and then the last one is curiosity. So we'll probably gather on that. And um, so I think Mr. Simpson won't watch for in a few hands in the past, so it's appreciate it. <laughs> <laughs> right, now the hard questions. That's just the lead up now. I know when I was first. Why did you do this? Um, there was a little punishment in my life. I was about to say. 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 I was
But John, I'm going to try and use the hard way here now. Now, we've talked about what we understand by the word man. <laughs> what do you understand by the word man? And where are we aiming to what we try to do with our voice? I think Ron wants to do it across the past. Now, I would say that if you had a magic wand and you were in charge of Ron Bosch and your man, Sean Simpson, what would you recommend now that Ron Bosch should be doing more of to make sure that there's a leading voice school that carries on being a leading voice school in this country? I would, I would like to say that our teachers, that our teachers continue to produce excellent results in the class. That would be normal, but I think that the teachers have to have continue to make them go out of their way to spend the time with the kids. It's not quite just spending the time, uh, I guess that, in the classroom for the consumer period of 45 minutes here without developing some kind of relationship with the kids. And I really do believe that it's, if you're a male, that you, you should, whether you do have an athletic school or go out of the way with the kids, Develop the relationship because I've no doubt that when you have a, a relationship with the kid, when it's from a water color that has very strong be that, that has a positive spin off in the class. And the person doesn't just see you as being a teacher, you develop a relationship with them. Even if it is a negative relationship where you told the kid to be shaved and it's tack his face. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> you develop a relationship and, and, and there's sincerity about what you want to get from that. Okay, just would it be, I still want that question answered, but just on, on, what I'm, on my question, but just on, on, on what Ron has said. Do you don't think that teachers are under more pressure than you do that, time-wise? Because here we are, very much, we've got to spend more time in schools, we're extremely building up relations, but yeah, I personally think that teachers are a huge pressure these days, time-wise. Do you agree that? Encourage the 
toy, toys that you really well, or toys that have got good hair to you. Even if it's coming from one hair, if it's coming from one hair, it doesn't mean you've got bad hair at all. But you're almost like a, 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 almost a form of charming woman that you don't hear into you. There comes a stage in every boy's life when he wakes up in the morning and he realizes he's calling his mother. <laughs> now that's a very significant moment. Because he now realizes that she can't <coughs> me. And that is when invariably on the night that he, after he wakes up with that thought, his mother says to him, take the dishes to the sink, please, Johnny. And Johnny says something along the lines of, why can't Sister Susie do it? Or not now, or I will in a moment, or why me? And that is where it's absolutely essential. The father puts down his newspaper and says, didn't you hear your mother? <laughs> now that sends all sorts of messages. First one is that the two are acting together. This is where being a single mother is, is so difficult. But they don't have that person putting down the newspaper and saying, didn't you hear your mother? They show that you're acting in concert between the two of you. Uh, and you're showing that standard that you two are working together. And that is so important. And it becomes important for male teachers and boys <coughs> to do the same for lady teachers. So when they hear a lady teacher being treated with a degree of disrespect, and they come in straight away and say, we don't accept that here. So you're sending the boy the message that men don't do things like this because the father's coming in to figure out what they're saying. That's what you're saying. Hey, I know you're so upset, but you're so upset, 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 and I saw a lot of kids, well, just generally speaking, with a lot of baggage in the front of their baggage, they're going to see the future baggage that comes with them. I did a talk with Tracy a couple of years ago, and the boys were talking about South African fear, but it comes nowhere else to come with them. Nowhere else. So I think that's a massive part of what they're doing. I would quite a few things I'd like to say. I think there's a period of time, five years, when you're at high school, where the school system and the process and the teachers and the environment have been an amazing opportunity to condition and shape boys, and shape their behavior. Um, and I was saying to Neil yesterday, I, think, I don't know if this happened, but what I, I don't know if you've identified what a role model boy is. What is a role model boy historically today, and what would you want a role model boy to be? The kind of people that we want them to be? Because I think boys are aspirational. I think they like to see something as far as something. So I think the, the system in the school is the tool for boys in a certain direction. Um, I agree with you completely. Boys have to understand choice and the consequences. Full stop. They can understand that. They are more often than not hoping to make the right decisions as opposed to wrong decisions. But there's a certain amount of luck in a boy's life where we all have grown up with certain people, we all do stupid things. And somehow we've got through it. We can understand the consequences more often than not. I think we do the right thing. Yeah, it's very funny that not everyone gets through it. Most of that. The jail population in this country is, I think, 90% home. Yeah. And I think maybe. Uh, that's a static quote, but I think there's specific reasons <coughs> why that comes from maybe a lot of the broken homes, <coughs> etc. But you said something when you were talking about risks. I think boys need to learn how to make themselves vulnerable. When you pull out of the comfort zone and whatever they make that might be, and I think a teacher or a coach or a peer is a massive part of making someone vulnerable. Because in a boy's mind, many years ago, maybe being vulnerable is a weakness, that's actually a massive thing. Where the real coach really happens, you pull out your hat. The risk of the wrong of faces is if you identify leadership and these boys perceive that those ten are the leaders, that's not how the world is in the top. Each individual is unique, each individual is a leader, each boy needs to start with something in their own life. Out of that, some might fall that fine. But I think there's quite an incentive to keep going with that. The thing for me about one of the boys as well is it seems to be. They seem to have character and they seem to have a backbone. They seem to have a lot less of a sense of entitlement. So that when they get a tough world out there, that they actually know how to put their, their body on the line and they do what they need to do. I think there's a massive risk amongst young people today have a sense of entitlement. There's been a lot of money that's been created in South Africa in the last 10 years. Where there are a lot of private school kids and public school kids who will probably always be looked after by mom and dad. And that's really a massive problem. I mean, one of us is avoided it in many ways. That's just my personal decision. Um, a few other points. I think you've got to love boys unconditionally. A lot of 
this time, then you get some punishment and we'll give you detention or something like that. I, I think I have a fuller insight, but I also do realize that I think for one watch to be great, or for any institution to be great, particularly in this day and age, requires an acceptance of the fact that every tradition should be allowed to be challenged. I don't always feel that was the case, and, and I'm content to allow inefficient traditions that are just to exist for their own sake and because they're old, uh, to keep on going. I love my school. When I was in school, I absolutely loved it. And there were things that I would love to have changed that would be great to be able to dialogue about. I think when I was in the younger grades, I could understand a little bit of this in this incident. But it, me and my friend, it's a good idea. And it's not that all ideas should be adopted, but I think bringing all these different stakeholders into offering the people that are offering the people that offer really good ideas about what change would be beneficial, I think is a key to an institution like this, which is almost entirely made up of students, that they are able to have some input and some say into what direction the school should be going. It's not to be a good I, the, the kids that I teach have loved this school more than the average kid now loves this school. And having just been on the squash tour where we met some other watch boys, they also loved this school. More than I remember my peers loving this school. And so I think uh, it's got a the need to do the work requires that the students of the school of the watch are allowed to be saved in their collaboration. And during support like I do, I, I often say, we've got 45 million people in this country and you will never compete for it. We just don't use all the talent we've got in this country. Mm -hmm. So I don't think we can tap a, a small percentage of the talent we've got in this country. We've just got to find the right way to do it. Are you fair to ask us a current member of staff? Are you going to break? You might have a sort of 20, 30 people in the answer. We are a very good school. The same thing that you create, we also try and develop the improvement. And I think that we're always striving for improvement. So, if you create, then you're taking it and you're pretty strong. But a very good school, I think when you get, when you said that you're a great school, and I think you almost feel that you have arrived, and you're going to go backwards from there. I didn't avoid the question. But I understand why, because they're all looking at you and you've got to get into the story on Monday. You say, well, we're not even quite good yet. Chris, is your whole school at the moment or the background always going on the right path? I think it's a better school than what I'm saying. I like to find the project along the way because I was involved in it. It's too much of it. But I think the real putting together two things there. You have got to have the humility to realize that you're going to You've also got to have the shared coming through that says, okay, we've always done that. And maybe it's a good thing, but it's somewhat because I have to see how sure it is. And if you can convince me, then fire. I will go with you and we'll we'll try to test the operation. <laughs> but we must be aware of, of, of some kind of humility that says no matter how good we are, the last thing we want is to say that the school is a living hope that allows itself to have reached the limit and to have a happy with that. In fact, we can only do that. You've got to say to yourself all the time, am I open, am I listening, am I aware of the fact that good as we are, we can do it. You want to have the last word? One thing that you said, I mean, I just think the one thing, I look back on all the as a great school, because I don't remember all the bad stuff and never knew the name of good stuff. But for me, a definition of honor, which is great, it means that the boys that leave the school, leave great for go out there on a coil or well on their way to the coil. I don't think they're making a difference. They're making a difference too. Mm -hmm. they're, they're going out there and they're not going to be a coil and they're not going to get on the coil. Mm -hmm. They're not going to be a coil. They're not going to be a coil.
Janssen and I urge you to read on. There's a pretty good article he says back in Finnish is that we can never read alone. We need others around us. We depend on all of us in this place to make it a true JF University, talking about the University of Peace Station. That probably sums up everything that you're trying to do this afternoon. So Sean, I commend you in doing what Chris has said. You've got me in from, from another school down the road. Um, you're making this earth a little bit flatter by getting opinions of other people. You've got another two head masters coming in tomorrow talking about their schools. I commend you in what you've done. I wish you well and your path of greatness. And thanks for watching.